Thank you for joining. I am Andre Mansour, and this is the Art and Science of the Jugular Venous Pulse. The work in this presentation is part of a larger project called Physical Diagnosis PDX. It's a free website, and if you like what you see in this presentation, you will love the website. I'd like to begin with a quote from prominent heart failure physician Carl Lear, who has written extensively on the importance of physical diagnosis. He writes, quote, the inability to properly assess the pressure level and wave contour of the internal jugular veins should encourage the cardiologist interested in heart failure to either learn and develop skill on this component of the physical examination or move to another area of cardiovascular medicine. We could not agree with this quote more, and while he was addressing cardiologists, this quote is even more applicable to the general internal medicine clinician, especially the hospitalist. Our approach to the jugular venous pulse includes three separate but related components. The first component is simply identifying the jugular venous pulse, and then from there performing a quantitative assessment and then a qualitative assessment. We'll talk about each of these components in some detail, and then we'll bring it all together at the end with a multimedia-based quiz. Section one, identification of the jugular venous pulse. This is the single most important of the three components simply because without it, components two and three cannot even be attempted. You will often hear from trainees and colleagues that the jugular venous pulse couldn't be visualized in a patient for X or Y reason, usually because of a large neck or the presence of a beard. In our experience, the jugular venous pulse is visible in the vast majority of patients. You just have to know where to look and how to find it. So where do we look for the jugular venous pulse? The place that you should go to first is the right internal jugular vein. It's ideal because of its direct route down into the right atrium. If you can't find the pulse on the right, then you should go to the left internal jugular vein next. And by the way, when we talk about the internal jugular veins, we're not actually visualizing the vessels themselves. We're visualizing the movement of the skin that overlies the vessels. If neither IJ is available, your third option is the external jugular vein. And unlike the IJ, the EJ is visible in the neck. You can see the vessel itself, much like you can see the veins on the back of your hand. If you've exhausted that list and you still can't find the pulse, there are other places to look, which we'll get into later in the talk. Let's talk about the steps to identifying the jugular venous pulse. The first and perhaps most important step is patient positioning. Half the time I walk into a patient's room, they're slouched in bed and they have several pillows jammed behind their head, causing their neck to be flexed up against their chest. And if you try to change the patient's angle by moving the back of the bed, it simply moves their head up and down, and that's not ideal. To remedy that, what I usually do is flatten the bed and help the patient scoot up so that their head is near the top end of it. Now when I move the back of the bed, their neck and torso will move as one unit, and that's what you want. You want the neck and the torso to be in the same plane, meaning that they're at the same angle. You also want the neck to be nice and relaxed. You don't want the sternocleidomastoid muscles to be flexed and obstruct your view. And often that's a matter of adding or subtracting pillows. In my experience, it's usually a matter of removing a pillow. After the patient is properly positioned, now you want to observe the neck. It may seem unnecessary to highlight observations as a separate step here, but we've done so to highlight how important it is because the tendency is to observe the neck from a perpendicular perspective. And if you do that, you're gonna miss subtle movement. You wanna approach the neck from a tangential vantage point. Imagine you're standing 10 feet from a wall and you're staring straight at it. You're looking at it from a perpendicular perspective. Now imagine you walk up to the wall and place your right ear against it. And now you're looking down the wall. That's a tangential perspective and that's how you wanna approach the neck. Next, you wanna locate movement. And the classic window for locating movement in the neck is between the patient's clavicle and the angle of their jaw. If the pulse is below the clavicle, you're not going to see it. If it's above the jaw, you may see it, but it's not ideal for evaluation. So you want to manipulate the patient's angle to either bring the pulse up from below the clavicle or down from above the jaw and into that window. Once you've found movement, you're not quite done. You have to then decide, is the movement that you're seeing venous or is it in fact arterial? And there are a host of strategies to help determine that. The first thing is the waveform. The arterial waveform has a single peak that is quick and sharp. The venous waveform, on the other hand, is double and undulating in nature, meaning it has a soft rise and fall. The most striking feature of the arterial pulse is the outward movement. That's what will catch your eye. It's active. Obviously, what goes out must come back in, but it does so subtly and gradually, and it's hardly noticeable. There's a passive retraction back to baseline. On the other hand, what will catch your eye about the venous pulse is the inward movement. The peaks are relatively passive and hard to notice, whereas the troughs are active and will really catch your eye. The breadth of movement can also be helpful. The arterial pulse tends to be more pinpoint, involving a relatively small area of the neck. 
whereas the venous pulse is diffuse involving a larger area of the neck. The arterial pulse is unaffected by patient position, the respiratory cycle, and abdominal pressure. And the reason that's the case is anatomical. The reason we see and feel the carotid pulse where we do, the reason we see and feel the radial pulse where we do, is because that's where those vessels course closest to the surface of the skin, which is entirely independent of patient position, respiratory cycle, and so forth. The venous pulse, on the other hand, is affected by these things. In terms of patient positioning, imagine you have a patient at 45 degrees and you see the venous pulse in the middle of their neck. If that patient is reclined back to a more supine position, the pulse will climb up their neck anatomically. If you do the opposite and sit the patient more upright, that pulse will move down the neck anatomically. In terms of the respiratory cycle, when we take a breath in, we decrease our intrathoracic pressure and that creates a vacuum, which will pull the column of blood down towards the heart. So normally the pulse will move down the neck with inspiration. Sometimes the opposite can occur where you have a paradoxical rise in jugular venous pressure with inspiration known as Kussmaul sign, and we'll get into that later in the talk. But if you see any change in location of the pulse in concert with the respiratory cycle, either down or up, that argues for a venous pulse. With regard to abdominal pressure, the venous pulse will move up the neck. And finally, the arterial pulse is palpable, whereas the venous pulse is almost always non-palpable, with a few exceptions. All right, so I want everyone to imagine that we're at this patient's bedside. And recall the steps that we take when evaluating the neck. The first step is patient positioning. He's at 45 degrees, his neck is nice and relaxed, and we're observing the neck from a tangential vantage point. And remember, the step after that is to locate movement in the neck. I think we can all appreciate movement in the top third of the neck, right around here. Now we must decide, is that venous or arterial? And if I were to just describe the movement I'm seeing in this video, I would say that there's a single peak that is quick and sharp. Obviously there's retraction back to baseline, but it does so subtly and gradually, and there's no active inward movement here. And it involves a relatively small area of the neck, right here. It's almost like you want to put your finger right over that spot, and if you did, you would feel it. It's palpable. These are all the features of an arterial pulse. And here we have an annotated version of the video. You can follow the cursor along the tracing and coordinate it with the movement that we're seeing in the neck. Now, I want you to take the movement that we're seeing in this video and compare it to the movement that we're going to see in the following video. So here we have a double peak, a double trough. It's undulating. It has a soft rise and fall. The inward movement is what catches my eye here. I can see the peaks, but they're sort of passive and inconspicuous. But that inward movement you're seeing, down, down, in, in. That movement is quite obvious, and that's what catches our eye. And look how diffuse it is. I can see movement from the clavicle stretching all the way up to the top third of the neck. So it's quite diffuse. These are all the features of a venous pulse. So these two back-to-back -back videos serve as nice examples to compare and contrast the features of an arterial pulse compared to a venous pulse. We mentioned abdominal jugular reflux. This is a physical exam maneuver where you put pressure on the patient's abdomen and you evaluate the effects on the jugular venous pulse. And there are several applications to this maneuver, but the one that we wanna focus on right now is how it can help you identify the jugular venous pulse. Because remember, we're still talking about component number one, identification of the jugular venous pulse. So how can it help us with that? Well, if I'm looking at the neck and I see movement, but I'm not sure if it's venous or arterial, and I put pressure on the patient's abdomen, and that pulse moves up the neck, then I'm much more confident that the movement we're seeing is venous. And here it is in action. You can see the cursor start off near the middle of the neck, and with abdominal pressure applied, it clearly climbs up the neck and winds up near the angle of the patient's jaw. We mentioned the places that you should look for the jugular venous pulse. We talked about the right IJ being most ideal, but sometimes it's not available, whether there's a catheter on that side, or sometimes the patient has a thrombus involving that vessel. Sometimes it's simply not explained. It's not clear why, but sometimes it's just not well seen on the right. In that case, you should then go to the left IJ. And this video is simply here to demonstrate the jugular venous pulse on the left side of the neck. You can absolutely appreciate and utilize it here on the left. If neither of the IJs is available, what was our third option? Our third option was the external jugular vein, or EJ. And here's a beautiful example of an EJ. It's this visible vessel right here in the neck. What's not ideal about this video is that it's not filmed from the most attractive vantage point. 
we are at a perpendicular here, and we already talked about the disadvantages of that perspective. We can see movement, which is great, but if you were to span over and assume a more tangential perspective, the movement that you're seeing here would be greatly enhanced. We would have a much richer experience. But what I do like about this video is that it shows a venous pulse and an arterial pulse side by side so that we can really appreciate the differences between them. Let's focus on the arterial pulse for a moment. Now this is probably an aneurysmal artery and so it perhaps involves a little more area of the neck than an arterial pulse typically does, but nonetheless all of its other features are classically arterial. There is a single peak that is quick and sharp. It does retract back to baseline, but there is no active inward component. And it does involve a relatively smaller area of the neck. Now compare that movement with the movement we're seeing just next to it in the venous pulse. This pulse is double undulating. Its inward components are most conspicuous, and look how diffuse it is. The movement involves a large part of the neck, stretching from the clavicle all the way up here. So this is a nice video for comparing the arterial and venous pulsations. All right, now, you've looked at the neck and you couldn't identify an IJ or an EJ. Don't stop there. A lot of clinicians would stop there and say that the jugular venous pulse was not visible. And if you do that, you might get burned because sometimes the jugular venous pressure is so high that the pulse doesn't drop below the angle of the jaw, even when the patient is in the upright position. So you have to look higher than the neck. There are a couple of classic locations where it might show up, and one of them is the periauricular area. I hope that you can all see and appreciate this inward movement right here next to the patient's ear. If you don't find it in the periauricular area, look a little higher. Sometimes it shows up in the patient's temple area, and it's this collapsing movement right here. The inward movement of the skin we are seeing here is classic for a venous pulsation. And if you don't find it there, look even higher. Sometimes it shows up in the patient's forehead. What we're seeing here is an unmistakable collapsing movement of a venous pulse. In all three of these examples, the clinicians who evaluated these patients said that the pulse was not visible, and that's because they simply failed to look high enough. That concludes section one of this talk, identification of the jugular venous pulse. Now that we know how to identify it, we are ready to move into component number two, which is quantitative assessment. This is also known as jugular venous pressure, or JVP. So we have moved from the umbrella term, jugular venous pulse, to a more specific term, jugular venous pressure, or JVP. When a clinician reports a JVP of 8 centimeters of water or 16 centimeters of water, he or she is reporting a quantitative assessment. We use this every day in the hospitals and clinics. We should begin by asking the question, what are we measuring? We are measuring right atrial pressure, but before we can interpret a JVP, we have to understand what normal right atrial pressure is. When measured via a catheter in millimeters of mercury, normal is less than 6. When measured via exam in centimeters of water, it's less than 8. Why do we care about right atrial pressure? Well, it has tremendous diagnostic utility. When that undifferentiated patient comes to us with dyspnea, the JVP exam is absolutely critical. At best, it will give you a diagnosis right then and there at the bedside, cost-free. At worst, it will narrow your differential diagnosis. If the JVP is normal, then that points away from many of the conditions on the differential. Beyond its diagnostic utility, we often use the JVP exam to establish and follow volume status in patients with a known diagnosis of heart failure, and that's because of the relationship between volume and pressure. So now that we know what we are measuring and why we are measuring it, we are ready to talk about how to measure it. We want to measure the height of the column of blood that's sitting above the right atrium. That serves as a manometer and will tell us in centimeters of water the pressure of the right atrium. The problem is the right atrium is in the middle of the chest and we can't see it. So we have to use landmarks that we can see to extrapolate to the right atrium. If we can figure out how high the column is above a landmark and we know how high that landmark is above the right atrium, then it's simple math to determine how high that column is above the right atrium. The angle of Louis is one such landmark, classically said to be five centimeters above the middle of the right atrium in any position. A nice study was done in 2002 where they used CT imaging and trigonometry to figure out how high the angle of Louis actually is above the right atrium in various patient positions. And it turns out that 5 centimeters is correct, but only in the supine position up to about 30 degrees. But beyond 30 degrees, it's more like 8 to 10 centimeters above the middle of the right atrium. The clavicles are another landmark that can be used, but only in the upright position where they are 12 to 16 centimeters above the middle of the right atrium. So again, if we can determine how high that column is above one of these landmarks, then we can use a correction factor to determine how high it is above the right atrium. 
Textbooks love to use this classic image here with a ruler situated vertically above the angle of Louis and another straight edge. There are multiple hands involved here and it looks really quite cumbersome. I have personally never done this. This is really not the way that we measure JVP at the bedside. Instead, I would encourage you to measure the width of your hand. For example, my hand is eight centimeters wide. And so I use my hand in place of the ruler. I take the pinky or hypothenar side of my hand and place that on the patient's angle of Louis with my thumb pointing up towards the ceiling and my palm facing the patient's neck. And now I will simply eyeball where the top of the column is relative to my hand. So imagine the patient's in the supine position, so the angle of Louis is five centimeters above the right atrium. If I see the top of the column near the top of my hand, well, my hand is eight centimeters, so it would be eight plus five is 13 centimeters of water. Maybe the top of the column reaches roughly half the width of my hand, so then it would be four plus five is nine centimeters of water. Sometimes the top of the column is above the top of my hand. So then I would add my left hand, sort of stack it on top. Imagine the top of the column is a hand and a half above the angle of Louis. Well, then that would be 12 centimeters for me, plus five is 17 centimeters of water, and that's how we measure the JVP at the bedside. This data comes from a 1973 study where they directly measured right atrial pressure and they plotted it on the x-axis and then simultaneously measured pressure within the right IJ, left IJ, and EJ, and those values were plotted on the y-axis. This data demonstrates two things. One, the right IJ is highly reliable for estimating right atrial pressure. This is quite a linear relationship here. The other thing that this demonstrates is that the left IJ and EJ are nearly as reliable as the right IJ. So you should feel comfortable using any of these vessels to estimate right atrial pressure. Imagine we are at this patient's bedside and we want to measure the jugular venous pressure or JVP. To do that, we first have to identify the jugular venous pulse. And remember, the first step in that process is patient positioning. We want to set ourselves up for success. In this case, the patient's neck and torso are in the same plane. Her neck is nice and relaxed and we are observing the neck from a tangential perspective. Next, we want to identify movement, and we can see movement right along here, and we know it's venous because look how diffuse it is, and there's obvious active inward motion. Now that we have identified the jugular venous pulse, we are ready to quantify it. In other words, we are ready to determine the jugular venous pressure or JVP. So where is the top of this column? I see movement all the way to the angle of the jaw. Let's assume that's the top of the column, but keep in mind that that's not an assumption I would necessarily be comfortable with because maybe the top of the column is even higher than that and we just can't see it. If I were truly at the bedside here, what I would do is increase the patient's angle to allow that column to drop to the middle or top third of the neck so I was sure that I was seeing the top of it. But for the sake of this example, let's assume the top of the column is at the angle of the jaw. This patient's at 45 degrees which means that the angle of Louis is eight to 10 centimeters above the middle of the right atrium. She's a slender woman, so we'll go with eight. So if we can figure out how high this column is above the angle of Louis, we simply add eight to it, and that's the JVP. I will tell you that the top of this column is 14 centimeters above the angle of Louis. So her JVP is 14 plus eight equals 22 centimeters of water. Now, anytime you see indentations like this in a patient's forehead, you should immediately consider long-standing elevated central venous pressure. Here is the same patient in a more supine position. You can see that those vessels are now engorged with blood. This is a similar patient that I saw earlier this year when I was working on the procedure service. We were asked to perform a paracentesis on this patient. And when we walked into the room, I could not help but notice the engorged veins in the temple area. And in fact, when he turned, you could see engorged veins all over his head. And here's the associated video. You can see those engorged veins here. And here's the EJ, it's this hose-like structure here in the neck. And look at the IJ, you can see that collapsing movement. It's classically venous. And when we span to the left, we see similar things. And in addition to that, look at the temple area. Right around here, you can see that inward collapsing movement, classic venous. He's in the upright position here. I turn to his wife. And uh, she was at the bedside and I said, you know, I couldn't help but notice these veins. Have you noticed them too? And she said that she had going back several months. She said that she asked many of her husband's clinicians about this and not only were they unable to provide an answer to tell her why his veins had become this way, but they also seemed dismissive of the question. They didn't seem interested. Well, we were interested. We were very interested and we asked the primary team to investigate Right heart catheterization was done and it revealed a right atrial pressure of 30 millimeters of mercury, which is right around 41 centimeters of water. 
So this gentleman was walking around with markedly elevated central venous pressure for some months with symptoms of heart failure, and it was simply missed. It was not observed by any of the clinicians that evaluated him, even when his wife pointed it out to them. Unfortunately, we have moved away from the fundamentals of medicine. Everyone knows how to order a cardiac MRI these days, but not many of us know how to read neck veins anymore. And this is a diagnosis that should have been made months ago. Uh, we would like to see a return to the fundamentals of medicine. Now, you've looked in the neck and you can't find the jugular venous pulse in the IJ or the EJ. You've looked in the periauricular area, the temple, the forehead, you can't seem to find it anywhere. There is one last place to look, one final refuge, and that is the patient's hands. You want to first look at the dorsum of the patient's hands for visible veins. Not everyone has them. If the patient has them, as in this case, you want to then raise the hand above the level of the central venous pressure and we'll know we're there because those veins will collapse. So watch as, we, as this hand is raised, those vessels are beginning to collapse and here we go, they're gone. So now we, we know we're above the central venous pressure. So then what we want to do is slowly lower the hand down until we reach that moment where those veins begin to fill again and there they are, they're, they're full again. So now we can extrapolate across. And if we can figure out how high this is above the angle of Louis, we can figure out how high the right atrial pressure is. The patient is in the supine position, so the angle of Louis here is five centimeters above the right atrium. And his hand veins begin to fill again around 20 centimeters above the angle of Louis. So his central venous pressure is 20 plus five is 25 centimeters of water. So that concludes sections one and two, identification of the jugular venous pulse and quantitative assessment of the jugular venous pulse. We are now ready to move into the third and slightly more sophisticated component, qualitative assessment. It's amazing what can be learned about the heart by looking at the waveform itself. I like to illustrate this point by asking a rhetorical question. What is Mobitz-1 heart block? I think most of us would answer this question electrocardiographically. We would define it as PR prolongation leading up to dropped QRS complexes on an EKG. And we wouldn't be wrong if we defined it that way. But what if I told you that Wenke Bach described Mobitz-1 years before the EKG was even available to him? So how did he do this? Well, he used the neck veins, but how? Hopefully by the end of this talk, we will be able to comfortably answer that question. Before we can talk about abnormalities of the jugular venous waveform, we have to be intimately familiar with the normal waveform, each component of the waveform, and which cardiac events cause them. So let's talk about each component. We'll start with the A wave, the first peak in the waveform. The A wave is caused by right atrial contraction, and obviously when the atrium contracts, pressure within the atrium goes up, giving rise to a positive pressure deflection, the A wave. When does right atrial contraction occur? Well, it, it occurs at the very end of diastole when the atrium is trying to squeeze the last bit of blood into the ventricle. And I like to orient myself to the cardiac cycle starting with the A wave because it then helps me identify the, the subsequent components of the waveform and, and, and the causes of those components. For example, after late diastole, now we're in early systole and we know that's when isovolumetric contraction occurs. The pressure builds up within the ventricle and that's going to slam the tricuspid valve closed. And when it closes, it bulges into the right atrium. And that's going to cause another small pressure blip, which is the C wave. The C wave, by the way, is not usually visible at the bedside. After isovolumetric contraction, we have actual mechanical contraction of the ventricle in mid systole. And when the ventricle contracts, it sort of twists and contorts down towards the apex. And when it does that, it pulls the floor of the right atrium towards the apex. And that's going to cause the column of blood to move down. At the same time, the atrium is relaxing. It just contracted, causing the A wave, and now it's relaxing to start this whole process over again. And obviously, when it relaxes, pressure within it is going to go down. So the combination of mechanical ventricular contraction and atrial relaxation causes the X descent. After mid-systole, the atrium just relaxed. And why did it relax? It relaxed so that it could fill with blood again. And when it's filling in late systole, that volume implies pressure. So as it's filling with blood, pressure goes up and that creates the V wave. 
So now we're done with systole and back in diastole. And what happens in early diastole? Well, the tricuspid valve is going to open up and blood moves passively from the right atrium to the right ventricle. And when the volume goes down in the right atrium as a result of that movement of blood, so does the pressure and that creates the Y descent. It's absolutely critical to become familiar with each component of the normal jugular venous waveform and what causes each component to understand when things go wrong. Let's revisit this video from earlier in the talk, the normal jugular venous pulse. Many people will tell you that the components of the waveform are not visible at the bedside and that they're simply a whiteboard phenomenon and you shouldn't bother looking for them at the bedside. Well, that is simply not true. And this video demonstrates that. And here is the annotated version. We can readily see each component of the waveform with the exception of the C wave. And recall that in the normal waveform, it's the troughs that are most conspicuous and you should start with those. I think we can all appreciate the X and Y troughs. But if you look close enough, you'll see the A and the V waves as well. Here is another video demonstrating each component of the waveform using a Q-tip. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is in any part of the cardiac exam, whether it's cardiac auscultation or evaluating the jugular venous pulse, to know where you are in the cardiac cycle. If you're looking at the jugular venous waveform in a vacuum, it's so hard to know whether that peak you're seeing is the A wave or the V wave, or whether the trough that you're seeing is the X or the Y descent. When I'm evaluating the waveform, you will often see me simultaneously listening to the heart or palpating a peripheral pulse, and I'm doing that because I'm trying to create or find a frame of reference for myself so that I can identify the A versus the V or the X versus the Y. There is one cardiac event in particular that is quite helpful for orienting us to the cardiac cycle and the jugular venous waveform, and that is S1, which we know is associated with closure of the tricuspid valve. It also occurs at the same time as the peripheral pulse. And what component of the jugular venous waveform is caused by closure of the tricuspid valve? We just talked about that, and that's the C wave. You can't usually see the C wave at the bedside, but it occurs right in the middle of the X descent. So the X descent occurs right along with S1 and the peripheral pulse. So if we're seeing a trough and we wanna know, is that trough the X or the Y? Well, if it's occurring concordant with S1 and the peripheral pulse, then it's the X descent. If it's discordant with those events, then it's the Y descent. Let's now revisit a video from earlier in the talk where we have a venous pulse next to an arterial pulse. And let's focus on the venous pulse for a moment. I think we can all appreciate the troughs here. There are two of them, but one of them is dominant. What if I asked you whether that dominant trough is the X or the Y, and how could you tell? Well, if we had the benefit of being at the patient's bedside, we could employ the strategies that we just talked about. We could simultaneously feel the peripheral pulse or listen to the heart. And if that trough is concordant with S1 and the pulse, then we would know it was the X descent. We're not at the bedside here, but we do have the benefit of an arterial pulse right next to the venous pulse. And we can see that the dominant trough occurs at the exact same time as this arterial pulse. So we know that it's the X descent. And that makes sense. The X descent is normally slightly more dominant than the Y. So now that we're familiar with the normal waveform, we are ready to discuss the abnormalities. The top tracing here is one that we are all familiar with, and that's the normal jugular venous waveform. The tracing below is abnormal, and what is abnormal about it? Well, we have lost our A wave, and the X descent is quite diminutive. And so we have to go back to what causes the A wave and what causes the X descent to understand what's going on here. The A wave is caused by right atrial contraction, as we just reviewed, and the X descent is caused, at least in part, by right atrial relaxation. So what condition results in a loss of coordinated atrial contraction and atrial relaxation? Well, that's atrial fibrillation. This waveform will also be occurring in an irregular rhythm. At the bedside, what you'll see here is simply a descent. You don't really see the C or V waves. You don't see the X descent. You will simply see a single descent, the Y descent, and it will be occurring at irregular intervals. Let's talk about the giant A wave next. So here we have an A wave that is larger than normal. And again, we have to go back to what causes the A wave. That's right atrial contraction. So what would cause the pressure in the right atrium to be greater than normal during right atrial contraction? Well, that will occur if you have any resistance to right ventricular filling. And that happens with tricuspid stenosis. It happens when right ventricular end diastolic pressure is elevated from something like pulmonary hypertension. 
at the bedside, what you will see is a peak that will catch your eye and that should automatically clue you in that something is not right about this waveform. Because remember, the peaks in the normal jugular venous waveform are inconspicuous. So you'll see this peak that catches your eye and it's followed by two troughs. And that's important, keep that in mind. Also keep in mind that the giant A wave occurs with every beat. Next up is the Canon A wave. So here we have an A wave that's even larger than the giant A wave. So what's worse than contracting against a stenotic tricuspid valve? Well, that's contracting against a totally closed tricuspid valve, which occurs with atrioventricular dissociation. The atria and ventricles are going at their own rhythms, so there's no coordination. So every once in a while, the atrium will contract against a closed tricuspid valve. And as you might imagine, that's going to create a large shock-like ripple up the neck. And it's typically intermittent, not always, but typically. In between the Canon A waves, you will get the normal jugular venous waveform. That's unlike the giant A wave, which occurs with every beat. Next up is the CV fusion wave, also known as Lanchese sign. Here we have lost our X descent, and it's been replaced by a large CV wave, which is followed by an augmented Y descent. This is caused by severe tricuspid regurgitation, and that makes sense because during ventricular systole, the atria are relaxing, causing the X descent. But in the setting of tricuspid regurgitation, you have a large bolus of blood that goes backward into the right atrium just at the time that it's trying to relax. And that creates, as you might imagine, a large pressure wave, followed by an augmented wide ascent, which occurs because of the comparatively larger gradient between the atrium and ventricle at the beginning of diastole, because now the atrium has not only the normal volume of venous return, but also the additional regurgitant bolus of blood from the tricuspid regurgitation. At the bedside, you will see a monophasic wave, a large wave followed by a large descent. Unlike the giant A wave, this peak is followed by one descent. Remember, the giant A wave is followed by two descents. The other way you could differentiate CV fusion and a giant A wave is timing. Remember, the CV fusion wave occurs in the middle of systole, whereas the giant A wave occurs at the very end of diastole. Next up is the sharp and deep Y descent, also known as Friedrich sign. This is associated with constrictive pericarditis and restrictive cardiomyopathy. The W sign is next, and here we have a deep X and Y descent. This is more specific for constriction than Friedrich sign. And why some patients with constriction develop sharp and deep X and Y descent rather than just a sharp and deep Y descent is not clear, but it is something that we see. The final tracing to discuss before we get into the fun part is Kussmaul sign, which is something that we mentioned earlier. So here we have a paradoxical rise in JVP with inspiration. Normally when we take a breath in, we decrease our intrathoracic pressure and that causes the column of blood to suck down toward the heart, which causes the normal decrease in JVP with inspiration. But remember, when we decrease intrathoracic pressure, that causes the mobilization of blood from the legs and elsewhere back to the mediastinum. And if there are any compliance issues with the RV, if it can't accept that increase in blood return, then that blood has nowhere else to go but up the neck, and that is Kussmaul sign. This is not a very specific sign, but it's quite sensitive for RV compliance issues from any cause. So let's move to the quiz mode of the talk. Here we're gonna show videos of neck veins one at a time, and we'll try to figure out what qualitative abnormality is present. Before we start, I wanted to mention a few things. First, assume the movement you're seeing in the neck in these videos is venous. Second, this will be challenging. The reason it's so challenging in large part is because we don't have the advantage of being at the patient's bedside, which as we discussed is helpful for determining where you are in the cardiac cycle. However, there are still some strategies that you can use to determine what abnormality is present. When you look at these videos, I want you to think, what catches my eye here? Is it a peak? Is it a trough? If it's a peak, as we already mentioned, that automatically suggests that something is not normal about this waveform. And that narrows the differential to essentially giant A wave, CV fusion, or canon A wave. If it's occurring with every beat, that makes canon A less likely. So then you're dealing with giant A wave versus CV fusion. From there, you can say, okay, how many troughs are there? If two troughs are present, it's a giant A wave. If there's only one trough, then it's a CV fusion wave. The other thing that you should pay attention to when you're watching these videos is respiratory variation. Does the JVP vary with respiration? Also pay attention to whether the pulse is regular or irregular. These things will help you. The last thing that I'll mention is that there are some repeats. So just because we see an abnormality once doesn't mean that we won't see it again. So with that said, let's show some videos. 
here's the first video. As you're watching this, think to yourself, what catches my eye about this waveform? Is it a peak or a trough? What I see is a single outward peak that catches my eye, which tells me right away that this is not a normal jugular venous waveform because typically the peaks are not so readily discernible. They're hard to see. So I see a single peak, which narrows my differential to giant A wave, CV fusion, or cannon A wave. It seems to be occurring here with every beat, which makes cannon A wave less likely. And plus, it's not a shock-like ripple up the neck that you would expect to see with a cannon A wave. It's more of a rolling wave. So is it a giant A wave or CV fusion? The question we want to ask is, are there two troughs following that peak or only one? I see only one trough following the outward peak. This is CV fusion or Lanchese sign occurring in a gentleman with severe tricuspid regurgitation from dilated cardiomyopathy. Here's the movie slowed down and annotated so that you can follow along with the tracing. Also notice that the wide ascent is quite augmented, which is typical of CV fusion. Here's the next video. What do we notice here? Pay careful attention to the respiratory cycle. Here's the annotated video and you can see the JVP in the middle of the neck during expiration that goes all the way to the angle of the jaw when the patient takes a breath in. And you can see the EJ and gorge as well. This is Kusmal sign. And this patient has another finding as well. You might notice that the X and Y descents are both quite sharp and deep. She has a W sign. This is a patient who developed constrictive pericarditis 20 years after heart transplant, giving rise to both Kusmal sign and the W sign. What do you notice about this video? What catches your eye? Is it a peak or a trough? To me, there is one trough in particular that is quite sharp and deep. Then you want to know, is that an X or a Y descent? If we were at the patient's bedside, we could easily figure that out by using the strategies that we talked about. I will tell you though, that this trough is discordant with S1 and the peripheral pulse, meaning that it is the Y descent. This is Friedrich's sign. You can see an X descent followed by a sharp and deep Y descent. This is a patient who developed subacute or transient constrictive pericarditis following an episode of hemorrhagic tamponade. Here's the next video. What do you notice here? What catches your eye? Is it a peak or a trough? When I look at this waveform, a peak really catches my eye and it occurs with every beat. So now I'm thinking, is that a giant A wave or CV fusion? The peak is followed by two troughs, making it a giant A wave. Here is the annotated version. This is a young woman who developed severe pulmonary hypertension from methamphetamine use, giving rise to giant A waves. What do you notice about the movement in this video? What happens when the patient takes a breath? That's right, this is another example of Kussmaul sign. Look at how the venous pulse moves all the way up the neck when the patient breathes in. This gentleman developed constrictive pericarditis after radiation therapy to the chest for Hodgkin's lymphoma. And if you look close enough, you can see a radiation tattoo marker just underneath the A wave in our logo indicative of prior radiation therapy to the chest. Let's look at the next video and what catches your eye here. I think there's a very obvious wave and what do you notice about that wave? It's only followed by one trough. This is CV fusion. 
This patient developed severe tricuspid regurgitation after a catheter damaged his tricuspid valve during a right heart cath procedure. What do you notice in this video? The finding here is something that we haven't yet talked about, but is very important to be aware of. There is respiratory variation, but the pattern is normal. The jugular venous pressure moves down with inspiration as we would normally expect, but look how marked it is. During expiration, the pulse is near the ear and it falls all the way down below the clavicle on inspiration. This is a patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Patients with lung disease can have a kind of a pseudo elevation in JVP when they exhale, probably related to abnormally large expiratory intrathoracic pressure from their lung disease. This is important to be aware of so that you don't get fooled by it like I have in the past. So what's happening in this video? What I see is a single trough. That's pretty much all I see, one single trough, and it's occurring in an irregular pattern. This patient has atrial fibrillation. You really only see the wide descent and it's irregular. Sometimes when two beats occur in quick succession, it can appear as an XY pair, but in reality, it's just two wide descents that are close together. Okay, so here's the next video, and what do you notice here? Does the JVP vary with respiration? Yep, this is another example of Kussmaul sign. This patient also had radiation treatment for mediastinal lymphoma many years before developing constriction. What's happening here in this video? What I see is a single peak followed by a single trough. This is another example of CV fusion or Lanchisi sign from severe tricuspid regurgitation. This is the first and only time I've seen the facial vein involved. This is a tough one, but again, begin by asking yourself, what catches my eye here? To me, there is one peak that really catches my attention. It occurs with every beat and is followed by two troughs. This is another example of giant A waves, this time related to tricuspid valve stenosis. This is a young man with a history of tricuspid valve endocarditis who had a bioprosthetic valve replacement, and the valve orifice was simply smaller than it needed to be. What's happening here in this video? We've seen this one a few times before. This is another example of Kussmaul sign, this time in a patient with right heart failure. I remember as a medical student being told that I might see Kussmaul sign maybe a few times in my career. I see it once a week at least. These findings are all out there. We just have to be aware of them and we have to think to look for them. The eyes don't see what the mind doesn't know. Here's the next video. What catches your eye here? I see a single peak that sort of ripples up the neck. It does not occur with every beat. It's intermittent. These are Canon A waves in a patient with complete heart block. Okay, last video. Here is Maximus from one of my favorite movies, Gladiator, who is not supposed to be alive at this point in the movie, by the way. But we know better because there's clearly a pulsation in his neck. The question is, is it venous or arterial? First of all, it's quite diffuse and has obvious inward motion, which are, of course, hallmark features of a venous pulse. 
Before we conclude, let's bring it back to Wenke Bach and answer the question we posed earlier in the talk. How did he describe Mobus 1 using the neck veins? Well, what is the P wave on the EKG? That's atrial depolarization slash contraction. And what's the equivalent of that in the neck? Well, that's the A wave. How about the R wave on the EKG? That's ventricular depolarization slash contraction. And what's the equivalent of that in the neck? That's the X descent. So he observed AX prolongation leading up to dropped arterial pulses. And that's how he described Mobitz 1 before he had an EKG available to him. It's remarkable how much we can learn about the heart simply by looking at the neck. That concludes the talk. Thank you so much for tuning in. Special thanks to medical students Joseph Nugin and Maniraj J. Raju for annotating and animating the videos in this talk. I would also like to thank doctors Peter Sullivan and Lynn Lorio for teaching me everything that I know about the jugular venous pulse. And last but most important, thank you to all of the patients who allowed me to record their findings for the purposes of medical education. Here are the references that I used for this talk. If you liked what you saw in this talk, you can go to these places for more.